The Exorcism of Mary Magdalene. You know, since the 1970s, there's a lot of movies, films, horror films about exorcisms. And every year around Easter, we talk a lot about St. Mary Magdalene. She is really the first witness in Scripture of the resurrection of Christ. And it's often overlooked that Mary Magdalene herself was possessed. In fact, sacred scripture says Mary Magdalene was possessed by seven demons. Seven devils were inside Mary Magdalene. It's recorded twice in the New Testament, once in Mark and once in Luke. So today I'm going to take you through those passages about the exorcism of Mary Magdalene. And then we're going to look at some church fathers, some early theologians, as they talk about what this means, that Mary Magdalene had seven demons, that they were exorcised from her. We'll also look at the meaning of her name in Hebrew Aramaic. All right, before we do that, though, we will pray together and uh, we'll pray the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father in Latin. In nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater noster, qui es in celi, sanctificetur nomen tuum, advenient regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tuas, cut in cello et in terra, panam nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nos amalo. Amen. Nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. St. Mary Magdalene, pray for us. All right, well, the first passage that I'm going to share with you is from the Gospel of St. Luke. And this is chapter 8, verses 2-3, and it's talking about the women who supported and accompanied our Lord Jesus Christ in his three years of ministry. And Luke chapter 8, verse 2, reads like this. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, who is called Magdalene, out of whom seven devils were gone forth, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod Stuart, and Susanna, and many others who ministered unto him of their substance. The word of the Lord. Now, what's really interesting here is Mary Magdalene is not the only one of these women, it seems, who has been exercised of demons. If you look at the beginning of verse 2, it talks about this group of women, and it says certain women who, collectively, had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Now, these women obviously were wealthy. They had money to support Christ. Christ was traveling. He he needed food. He needed things. These women, it seems, were providing those things, so they were wealthy. But these women had been under the bondage of evil spirits and infirmities. Joanna, Susanna, and here we see Mary, who is called Magdalene. And then it makes a parenthetical statement, out of whom seven devils were gone forth. Now, the next place we find it is in Mark's Gospel. This is in the longer ending of St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 9. Here we read, But he, rising early the first day of the week, appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. End quote. So nowhere in sacred scripture do we get an actual account of when and how he cast out devils. There's other places in the Gospels where we get detailed narrative on how he cast out demons. Here, it's in the past tense, and presumably this is one of the reasons, if not the prime reason, why Mary Magdalene and these other women are ministering to him, providing for his needs, and following him around, listening to his teaching. And of course, we know later, Mary Magdalene and the other women go to the tomb with spices to anoint his body. And of course, this is the manifestation of Christ's resurrection. Now, about her name, St. Bede, he says, because where sin abounded, grace hath super abounded. And then he says, a woman was the beginner of transgression. He's talking about Eve. A woman first tasted death, but in Magdalene, woman first saw the resurrection that woman might not bear the perpetual guilt of transgressions among men. And then St. Bede talks about her name, 
and he notes that uh, Mara, Maria, Miriam, all these names for Mary, they come from the Hebrew meaning bitter. And in Latin, Maria refers to seas. So Bede said, uh, Mary Magdalene is like the bitter seas and this bitterness of repentance that then turns into joy. Now, more mysterious is her last name before we get to her exorcism. Magdalena, Magdalene, Migdal. The Hebrew Aramaic Migdal means turreted or castle, like a city that has turrets on it, castles. And St. Jerome says that she was rightly called Migdal or Magdalene because she was turreted. She was built up like a castle in her zeal and her love for Jesus Christ. Now, Origen, the church father, who's not a saint, for reasons I've talked about in other videos here on the podcast, Origen actually says that the root there for Migdal, which is in Hebrew, Gadal, means great or magnified. And so he's saying it's a title because it says Mary who was called Magdalene. It's a title given to Mary, basically Mary the Great, because Christ exalted her and praised her for her repentance, her devotion, her love. Wherever the gospel is preached, if you identify that Mary with Mary Magdalene, she is commemorated. And of course, she's the first to see Christ that morning and then go and tell the apostles, the Lord is risen. Okay, now, about her exorcism and her identity. Is she a harlot? Is she an adulteress? Um, why is she possessed by seven demons? St. Augustine, in homily 33, he says that Mary Magdalene was a married woman who was a loose woman. And so she was actually an adulteress. St. Jerome speculates that she was actually had been widowed and was all after being widowed a sin, uh, sinful woman. We do know that she appears in Judea, perhaps also up in Galilee. And when we get to the, the casting out of the seven demons, a number of theologians, fathers, say that the number seven indicates that Mary Magdalene was perfectly, perfectly possessed by demons. And by perfect here, I'm using it in a negative sense, that she was full of demons. She just didn't have one. She had seven. Of course, seven is the number of perfection, but here's an inverse of something demonic. Now, St. Bede and St. Gregory the Great, they say that the number seven for the demons signifies the seven deadly sins, the seven capital sins. And if you watch my podcast, you know that I give you a little memory tool to remember the seven deadly sins, and that is pale gas. Like, the pale gas in here is deadly, nasty. I know it's cheesy, but you're never going to forget it. Pale gas, and that is pride, anger, lust, envy, gluttony, avarice, and sloth. Pale gas. Pride, anger, lust, envy, gluttony, avarice, sloth. I go through this list as I'm waiting in line for confession. I find that it, more than the Ten Commandments, which are good as well, the seven deadly sins, the capital sins, go into the deeper desires, the deeper concupiscence. And in the evenings when I make a, God willing, a hopefully good examination of conscience, I also go through pale gas. How was I prideful today? Did I judge people? Did I say something unkind? Anger? Did I get angry at someone? Did I have angry thoughts? Lust? Did I keep custody of my eyes? Did I have impure thoughts? Envy? Did I Was I jealous of another person? Gluttony? Did I overeat? Did I drink too much? Um, avarice? Was I worried or concerned about money or greedy? And then sloth? Did I say my prayers? Did I do my duties? Was I good to my family? Did I live up to who I'm supposed to be? That's it. So Gregory the Great says that Mary Magdalene was possessed by these seven unclean spirits of pale gas, pride, anger, lust, envy, gluttony, avarice, and sloth. Now, this has led others to say, well, does that mean that she was really possessed by demons, or is this just sort of a 
poetic allusion to being a really evil person. And other saints and church fathers have weighed in and said, no, she was really possessed. It says in the gospel, spirits came out of her. Demons came out of her. So she literally was possessed by seven evil spirits. For example, St. Ambrose and I believe St. Augustine both teach that. So we can see that Mary Magdalene was a sinful woman. She was possessed not by one demon, but by seven demons. But Christ, through her faith, through her hope, through her charity, she submitted her whole self, her body and her soul to Jesus Christ. And he, because of her faith and love, cast out these demons. And she was, in the history of the church, the greatest penitent. She who has been forgiven much, loves much. She loves Jesus Christ. Christ didn't choose Peter to see the empty tomb. Didn't choose John. Didn't choose, name a saint, Paul. He chose Mary Magdalene. Now, there is before we close up here, there is a little bit of confusion on all the different Marys in the four Gospels. And there's also a little bit of a distinction between the Eastern tradition and the Western tradition. In the Western tradition, following Pope Gregory the Great, he gave some sermons in the year A.D., the year of our Lord, 591. And he says that Mary Magdalene is the same sinful woman in Luke who anoints the feet of Jesus. And the reason that he makes that connection is because right in Luke, when he names Mary Magdalene, out of whom were seven demons cast out, just a few verses before that, he tells the story of the sinful woman who anoints the feet of Jesus. So if you read this in a narrative context, it almost seems like Luke is turning the page and saying, and, and now about Mary Magdalene, who had seven demons. And in a way, the narrative connects the episode of the sinful woman who anoints the feet of Jesus at Luke 7:36 through 50, with then Luke chapter 8, Mary of uh, Mary Magdalene, out of whom seven demons were cast. I actually think that that makes sense, and I agree with Gregory the Great on that. Now, there's also another Mary named Mary of Bethany. She is the sister of Martha and Lazarus. We read about them in Luke chapter 10, and John, of course, also mentions them as well, the whole Lazarus story. Pope Gregory the Great also identifies Mary of Bethany as Mary Magdalene. So according to Gregory Great, when you read the sinful woman who anoints the feet, you read of Mary of Bethany who also anointed Christ, and then you read of Mary Magdalene, that's all the same Mary. Now in the Eastern Church, they make a distinction between Mary Magdalene as one person and Mary of Bethany as another person. So when you see like an icon of the myrrh bearers in the Eastern tradition, you're going to see on there the various women, Mary of Cleophas, Susanna, Joanna, and you're going to see Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany. So in the Eastern tradition, they see that as two uh, distinct women. As we go through this Easter tide, this time of resurrection, and we celebrate Mary Magdalene, her great love, her great devotion, um, I think it's hopeful to all of us who have sinned, who have maybe lived a life not in accord with God's will. Uh, here's a woman who, who was a sinful woman. And think about, in a way, you know, it's kind of, we call her the apostle to the apostles. She's the one who told the apostle about the resurrection. And we're like, wow, Mary Magdalene had this great privilege. But also consider the embarrassment that the Bible that is read for 2,000 years, records her failings and her possession by demons. So not only do we remember all the good she did, it's also in there. It's, it's you know, think about if, if your story, your sins, the nastiness in your life were actually put in the Bible for everybody to read. That in itself shows a great humility and devotion that she has for Christ. So St. Mary Magdalene, pray for us. I would also encourage you all, um, if you're a mother or father, pray every evening over your home and over your children binding prayers. If there are any unclean spirits, any demons in this home are tempting us through the blood of Jesus, by the prayers of St. Joseph, 
We bind them and send them to the feet of Jesus Christ to be judged, punished, and never to bother us again. You see this beautiful picture here from the Passion of the Christ. That's Mary Magdalene at the feet of Jesus. At the feet of Jesus. That is where we want to be. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please hit the like button and please share it. That's the most important thing you can do for me. Share it. Right below this video is a share button. If you're in the live chat, turn that off. Go to share. Share it on Facebook, Twitter, Gab, Parlor. If you're new, please hit the subscribe button also in the bottom right corner and hit the bell to be notified every time I go live. And if you're on a mobile device, make sure you turn notifications on for YouTube. We'll close here with a prayer. We'll do the Ave Maria in Latin. In nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in molieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or per nobis peccatoribus, nunc et or mortis nostre. Amen. Sancta Mary, Mary Magdalena, ora pro nobis. In nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, friends. Pray the rosary. If you're at the feet of Jesus on the cross, guess who's right there with you? The other Mary, the Theotokos, the mother of God, Mary most holy. Pray the rosary every day. The rosary is powerful. Do not let an evangelical or a Protestant tell you otherwise. These beads are the chain of hope. And Mary's soul magnifies the Lord, which means when you look at Jesus through Mary, you see Christ magnified. Pray the rosary every day or you're not on the team. And remember, our Lord Jesus Christ says you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless and Godspeed.